Here we're going to look at a nice and classic infinite of a sum type problem. So let's see what we've got. We've got this double limit as m and n go to infinity of the sum as k goes from 1 to n of n over m squared k squared plus n squared. And I want to make a little remark about this problem before we jump into the solution. And that is there is so much going on here that there is probably a trick that makes this simple. And look what we've got. We've got this sum from one to n, and then we've got this double limit on the outside. So if this doesn't simplify quite a bit pretty easily, then this problem is super, super hard. But generally, unless you're doing research mathematics, most of the problems that you end up looking at are fairly simple. So let's see what we do right here. Okay, so what I'd like to notice first is that I can factor an n squared out of the denominator and that's gonna simplify things a little bit. So let's see what I get if I do that. So I'm gonna rewrite this as the limit as m goes to infinity of the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n times my sum as k goes from one up to n of one over m squared k squared over n squared plus one. Now you might look at this and say, well, what happened to this n in the numerator? I factored an n squared out of the denominator, but when I factored that n squared out of the denominator, it canceled with an n in the numerator to give me this one over n type object. Okay, cool. But looking at this, I see that this looks quite a bit like a Riemann sum of a definite integral. Well, let's maybe put a kind of dictionary to transfer this to exactly an integral, which will be a little bit easier to calculate. So let's see, our delta x is probably gonna be one over n. That's good to keep in mind. And then my x sub k, it looks like it's going to be m times k over n. Okay, so keeping that in mind, I can rewrite this as the limit as m goes to infinity of the limit as n goes to infinity of delta x times my sum as k goes from one up to n of one over xk squared plus one. Okay, so that's shaping up. Now this bit, which I have an orange box around, is most definitely the limit of a Riemann sum, which means it can be rewritten as a definite integral. The real question is, what are the endpoints of this definite integral? Well, let's notice when k is equal to one, that means x sub k is equal to m over n, but that's approaching zero as n goes to infinity. You might be a little worried about this because we have this m, and the m limit is also occurring, but this m limit is outside of the n limit. Okay, and then let's see what happens when we have k equals n. So if k is equal to n, then that gives us x sub k is equal to m. Okay, great. So that gives us our lower bound and our upper bound for the integral, meaning that we can rewrite this as the limit as m goes to infinity of the integral from zero to m of one over x squared plus one dx. But that has a fairly standard antiderivative. This is going to give us the limit as m approaches infinity of the inverse tangent of x evaluated at 0 and m. Now it's well known that the inverse tangent of 0 is equal to 0, so that just leaves us with the limit as m goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of m. So our final question to finish this whole thing off is what is the limit of the inverse tangent as that argument tends off towards positive infinity, but that's kind of well known, and that is equal to pi over two. Okay, so let's see what we've done here. We've taken our double limit of our sum and rewritten it as the limit of 
the limit of a Riemann sum. That limit of a Riemann sum can be rewritten as a definite integral. So we have a limit of a definite integral that in fact gives us an improper integral, but we kind of skip that step. Finishing it all off, we took the limit of the antiderivative giving us pi over two in the end. Now, before I leave you guys, I wanna notice that I made an implicit assumption here about the ordering of these two limits. I took the limit as n goes to infinity on the inside and the limit as m goes to infinity on the outside. So I think it would maybe be a good homework exercise to see what happens if we change the order of these limits. So if this is a well-behaved object, that should not affect the final answer. But I don't think that is super obvious just from looking at it and not diving into the structure of this. And that's a good place to stop.